Hi, uh, welcome. My name is Scott Rigglesworth, and uh, I'm the Commercial and Portfolio Analytics uh, Manager for the U.S. Strategic Business Unit for the AES Corporation. I work out of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, I've actually been in the Send Analytics product customer for close to nine years now, and uh, I am a, a frequent user of PowerSim, the PowerCube, and the other tools in the PowerSim suite. Today I'm going to talk about some of the things related to techniques that you can use um, to transition from position management to portfolio management. And um, some of that has to do with different metrics that you can rely upon that a tool like PowerSim affords you. And others are uh, related to managing expectations within your business with regard to budgets, uh, actions that you can take to hedge. And um, so we'll talk about some of those things uh, more completely. Uh, some of the ideas here that we'll discuss um, are, are moving away from pure position, so volumes to value metrics, uh, having your risk inform your hedging instead of having your hedging output um, your risk. And then uh, when we say that, what we mean is instead of letting um, a risk policy tell you what your risk is after you've applied the risk policy, you can use a tool like PowerSim to uh, have your risk metrics coming out of the tool suggest how you might shape your risk policy. Next, we'll look at what metrics are most informative and you, you can think about them in the context of your firm. We'll talk about the budgets, like I mentioned, forecasting and tracking against actuals. And then uh, the last two things here, we'll understand the drivers of the risk in the portfolio beyond what you can hedge with a, a block transaction in the wholesale market. And we'll consider active management of portfolio. Uh, positions and risk. So pure position and target hedging. This is common in most businesses. Uh, it's a practice that uh, has been one that AES has, has employed on its journey. And, and I'm sure uh, is one that you've seen other places, if not are using yourself. Pure position basically um, sets a, a budget hedge um, in place. So I, I consider uh, what numbers I'm locking in for the year, what the expectations will be of me and my division, and I uh, put a hedge on so that I know that my exposure uh, can keep me close to that budget number. Typically, those hedges are against a volumetric production level. So if I have a series of power plants, I will determine the physical megawatts that those uh, assets will create throughout the year, and I will put on hedges to offset that expected production. Goals may be to preserve some upside and offset asset risk. So I might not know exactly how much I'll produce because of a variety of factors. Uh, I might want to leave some of my asset available in the event that prices run up um, and, and I want to participate in that in the market. Uh, there could be other factors, but for this example, we're just going to use an arbitrary 75% hedge ratio. A static approach makes uh, or uses a mindset of set it and forget it. So a static approach to hedging says, at the time of my budget, I'm going to put my position on for the year, and uh, it might adjust it a little bit, but I'm basically set for the year. So this is what it looks like. These green bars would represent the production from my megawatts, uh, for my asset, and I would have length seasonally each month of the year. I would put hedges on, block hedges, say, from the wholesale market. To offset those, my net position, the orange line, is roughly 25% uh, length by the month throughout the year. A more robust uh, approach to volumetric hedging um, can, that can be employed for, for a budget is to simulate potential outcomes. So instead of having certainty in, in this example about what each month's production level will be, we introduce uncertainty in the production. And when we do that, um, we acknowledge the fact that we don't necessarily know the future. So we can see how our volume hedge that we might set at a point in time, say the time of my budget, beginning of the year, how that will perform 
against a variety of outcomes for my assets. <clears throat> when we evaluate the potential outcomes relative to the current hedge target, we can see a range of uncertainty, as I'll show you here in a moment. Incremental value is um, captured here in terms of uh, knowledge when you simulate the distribution of position. Uh, it can give you insight into the, those outcomes and uh, can help move you away from relying upon just a, a static figure. So in this case, say this company that we're using that sets their hedge level at an arbitrary 75% actually has a policy that says uh, assets need to be hedged between 75 and 85%. So they afford some measure of flexibility to the business. The current hedge level at 75% clients. The risk manager looking only at that physical position, the expectation for production versus the hedges would say they're within compliance. They're between the 75 and the 85%. However, when we simulate outcomes for position, we see that quite often expectations fall outside of the policy range. So 75% um, right now, maybe that's the mean expectation or close to the mean, but there's maybe 40, 50% of this distribution that falls outside of, of the, uh, the target range that's set in the risk policy. Why is that? Well, um, a hedge level resulting from high generation is gonna be under hedge. So at the P95, the 95th percentile of outcomes, if I uh, have high generation and I had a static hedge, my hedge was too low to preserve uh, a 75% hedge level. On the flip side, if I have uh, poor production for my assets, then I might be overhedged because I, I may have uh, less production and my hedge is static. So these outcomes are something that we can garner from a uh, simulation model like PowerSim, and we can report on it and give perspective about the, uh, the potential range of outcomes relative to a risk policy metric or a, he a target hedge. This is a good example of what I mentioned earlier also of, of one way that uh, outcomes from a risk model can inform your, your risk policy. So given the fact that there's a significant potential for uh, low and high uh, hedge levels, high and low production, I may want to uh, shape my hedge target a little differently or I might have uh, something, an incentive or some sort of uh, trigger in my, my hedge target that monitors this uh, daily to adjust as necessary. However, volumes aren't everything. So when we talk about hedging, most people think in terms of physical quantities, megawatt hours, uh, coal, natural gas for fuel, and, and those activities are, are usually typically driven off of a physical mindset. What we're gonna talk about here is looking at it from a value perspective. So what are you trying to hedge? Well, really you're not trying to hedge physical volumes, you're trying to hedge value. You're trying to hedge dollars. So if we make an assumption that an asset is dispatch, uh, dispatching against market prices and um, we want the value to be preserved. If we make an assumption that the optimal hedge is one that has the lowest risk value, then we have to decide which risk value uh, or what valuation of risk do we want to employ. Two examples here. One example here is gross margin at risk. The other is conditional value at risk. Both are similar, a slight difference. Um, gross margin at risk would be for a given time period taking your mean and then measuring um, that mean less the P5, the fifth percentile event. A discrete event in the distribution, it would give you one number. Uh, conditional value at risk is basically the same thing with the caveat that it takes the average of the tail. So if you have a fat tail or a long tail, that average will be a bigger number and will uh, adjust your risk metric slightly to give you a little bit different perspective. When you have a tool like PowerSim using simulations um, in the data around those simulations and pulling out a lot of detail and, and really diving in and understanding it, 
you can evaluate your risk to minimize, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, you can measure your risk to minimize um, that risk and give you a good hedge level. So he here's one way you might uh, see it or perceive it, and that is uh, through a U plot. So this is trying to decompose the risk versus a hedge percentage. Um, in, in this example, let's assume we have the same asset we did earlier, and we're only looking in this case at the July position. And we say, what's the optimal hedge level for July? Uh, hedging, you'll notice here at 100% is not optimal. Um, quickly, the, the left axis is the gross margin at risk, and the uh, bottom axis, the, the uh, x-axis, is our hedge level or our hedge percentage. You'll notice that the, the lowest range or the lowest point in that U shape is kind of between that uh, 60, or I'm sorry, that, that 85, 80 to 90 percent level. Um, but at 100 percent, it's discernibly higher uh, a risk than at its low point. And some of the reasons for that might be that this hedge instrument is uh, a linear block hedge. Uh, for the month as opposed to something that's shaped like the dispatch of the power plant. Power plant, unless it's in the money all the time, will be ramping up and down uh, and responding to market signals. Its production won't be a block per se of the month. It will be uh, some sort of shape. And the difference between that and a, and a block hedge instrument will be that 100% uh, hedge level is not ideal. Also, um, you might have other factors that, that come into play, uh, not noted here in the slide, but one classic example is outage rates, uh, forced outage rates of the assets. And depending on the uncertainty of those, you can, you can certainly see a, a, a tailing, if you will, between 100% um, and, and some other level uh, due to the fact that there's some uncertainty in the production volume. That lowest point on the curve, as mentioned, conveys that best position for risk reduction. Uh, and it, it might help inform your risk policy. <clears throat> the same data can be perceived differently. Uh, here, the red line is a linear hedge instrument. Uh, and the green line, the green dots, are outputs from the asset. These are value outputs in gross margin relative to market price levels. So you can see. If I am short and prices rise, I'm going to have a lower payoff with my hedge. And if I'm uh, long my asset and prices rise, I'm going to have an increased payoff. That, that hourly shape of prices, that forced outage rate, gives me dispersion on, on the green uh, plots. So you can see that while I hedge with the, the green dots with the red dots, at each price level, I don't completely eliminate risk. There's some uncertainty in that combined output, which is the uh, gold dots. Those gold dots would represent the combined portfolio. This does give some sense of where value resides at different pricing levels. So when prices are high, we can, we can clearly perceive that my value is coming from my asset. My hedge is um, serving its purpose, but is paying off below zero. Likewise, at a low price level, I can clearly see and explain to, to my internal clients, uh, my executives, my risk folks, that um, my hedge is actually giving me quite a bit of value while my asset is lagging uh, at that price level. This is all predicated on, on the idea of um, uh, marking your hedges to market, marking your asset to market. Uh, PowerSim in its native form does this naturally with how it's configured. Uh, so you, you can avoid having to decompose hedges or loads from assets um, because it's already uh, set up and, and configured so that each item uh, in your portfolio it has a valuation unique to itself. And you can find what those values are uh, across iterations, across simulations. This is notably different than mark-to-market -mark accounting. So being able to, to uh, apply a, a mark to your hedges doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be in a world where you're doing mark-to-market -mark accounting. Um, sometimes there's a concern or objection that those two things have to be done simultaneously. For risk analysis, uh, it's a great way to be able to understand 
your um, your portfolio, uh, regardless of how your uh, accounting treatment is set up. Uh, this can also be used to to show potential impacts of incremental hedges. We could apply additional hedges uh, along with the red line and see how does that change the nature of the, the portfolio and in gold. Um, and, and having the ability gives some insights as to the benefits of the, uh, the hedge instruments that we use or the hedge level that we uh, employ. So um, here the green line is going to represent uh, that asset. So this is the naked asset. Uh, and then uh, we applied a 75% level uh, hedge level to that portfolio, uh, not on this last slide, but uh, separately. And you can see that applying an arbitrary 75% hedge um, does quite a bit of good work with respect to reducing risk. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the downside uh, is significantly lessened, albeit at the expense of the upside. Um, but uh, this shape, uh, this distribution is, is a, uh, well on our way to a good hedge. The question becomes, can we get it a better hedge? So is it better to use a model to tell us what the optimal risk level is as opposed to uh, simply picking a number? And in this case, you can see um, for the month of July, we chose uh, that optimal hedge level and we've actually gotten a, an even better distribution, uh, more risk reduction out of that uh, portfolio because of the, the optimal level. There's other metrics that you may use that uh, your team may use. Um, I'm not going to talk about them at much here, but value at risk. Uh, value at risk typically is for a short-term time horizon. It's most relevant if there's a spec book. So even if it's a, a, an energy trading shop, if there's a spec book, then certainly they're looking at value at risk. Uh, but if they're just hedging an asset, it's probably not the, the greatest metric to be using uh, as you're looking at a term position and your risk out over a, a, a lengthy time horizon. Expected tail loss is also one. It's it's also um, you know synonymous with conditional value risk or average value at risk. Uh, if the average of that tail, uh, it can be additive, so you can um, decompose, you can use it to help decompose or aggregate risks. In our experience at AES, this is helpful, especially in our Latin American portfolios where there's a lot of hydrology and where there's foreign exchange. Um, and so we can, we can use this to take apart some of the components of our risk to understand where the drivers are. Um, it's, it's helpful. Cash flow at risk can also be a useful measure uh, of uncertainty through time. Many of these are similar to one another, but uh, slightly um, different for the different purposes that they serve. Uh, one way that you can use an output model, um, a simulation model, I'm sorry, uh, like PowerSim and use the outputs uh, on a, a time series is to help uh, your finance folks or your management understand where risk is uh, out the time horizon. Uh, this example, we're going to take um, the asset. So this is, again, the, an unhedged asset. is the green line, the mean expectation. The dotted lines above and below represent the 95th outcome uh, and the fifth outcome across simulations. So uh, if I were to look at this, for example, in the summer of year one, uh, in July, uh, I expect to earn $3 million in margin, but I may only earn one, and I, I might earn five, right? That's part of the uh, message or, or thought that um, this conveys. But you can see what that looks like over time. When we layer in that arbitrary 75% hedge, we see uh, we certainly tightened it. This is the same, um, same information being presented a different way. Uh, for a given period. So here you can see that we've lessened our risk to or our, our risk by by bringing down our gross margin potential to just over four million, while raising that downside from one million to about one and three quarter million dollars. So we've actually reduced the risk around the expectation of three million. This next one will show you the impact of. Uh, finding the optimal hedge level for each month 
in assuming that one were to hedge against that level and then uh, experience the outcomes across the simulations in, in the study be, behind uh, uh, the data. And so what you see here is that while it's not dramatic, there is an incremental benefit almost every uh, month through the entire term of, of this uh, assets um, time uh, uh, forecast here. So where this is particularly valuable would be to take this to say a finance department that's budgeting and um, you know, say I am I'm I'm signing up for the green line, but I've got some measure of uncertainty. It could be as great as X and as low as Y. Uh, it's a it's a useful tool to help people understand how much things could be different than what is set up as the expectation. So as we um, look ahead here, we're going to talk about then how we take uh, information like this and use it to help in uh, budgeting and what techniques we can employ for, for hedging when we're thinking about a budget and kind of the, the benefits of it. How can we use it? Uh, how can we use a model like PowerSim? So preliminary hedges are typically set at the time of a budget cycle to reduce risk uh, because if you were to commit to a budget number without hedges in place and then had a market movement, uh, you may not ever be able to get back to your budget number because of um, a drop in prices. Uh, it certainly can work inversely. Prices could rise and you could be uh, happy that you were under hedged, but uh, up or down, you, you've entered the budget cycle with risk. So pre preliminary hedges are typically set at that budget cycle to preserve at least most of that uh, budgeted value for your portfolio. Uh, as you go through the process, you'll want those reported risk metrics that we talked about earlier, especially conditional value at risk, to inform decision makers of the realistic risk around their budget. So case in point, back to this slide, uh, it's really valuable to be able to, to show this to a CFO and have him realize that, well, you budgeted, say, $3 million for gross margin in July, you've got uncertainty ranging from uh, two to four million. Uh, you also can allow your risk metrics to inform that optimal hedge level um, as you go through um, and, and try to uh, actively manage your portfolio, which we'll touch on later. So this slide here, we're gonna set up some information. Uh, this is all fake data uh, meant to be illustrative. But we're going to use two or three terms here. Budget, um, we want to make sure we're on the same page here. Budget is the projection when you set it at the beginning of a fiscal year, okay, the, ex the expectation. When I use forecast here, uh, it's kind of a reforecasting as I go through the year, uh, a pro forma, if you will. But most importantly, it's, the, it's that last projection before you enter a month. So if I'm sitting on uh, July uh, 30th, 31st, uh, and I'm going to go into August, what's my last projection before I enter August? Um, knowing what that is is helpful. I can explain what's happened on my journey from the time of my budget to July 31st, and then I can explain as I go through August what's happening during the month and then kind of after the month's over, those actuals, what do they represent relative to my beginning of month forecast and my budget? Uh, at AES in the uh, United States Business Unit, uh, for many of our coal and gas assets, we've found this to be uh, highly useful. It helps in explaining things to folks, giving them insights into the causes of variance and changes. Um, we've had to do a lot of legwork. We've had to set up our models consistent with how our actuals and our settlement is represented. And it's taken some some configuration efforts, but it's paid off. It's been very valuable. Uh, it adds to credibility. Um, people who see that you're able to explain things um, will rely upon you and your tools more. And a tool like PowerSim has helped us uh, on that journey. It also helps you improve because it gives you insights into um, what things maybe you didn't do so well, so you can learn from them and, and ex execute uh, better in the future. Um, and then um, when you set up this process, if you invest the time and effort, um, PowerSim will give you the budget, it'll give you the forecast, 
it's not going to give you the actuals. You'll have to configure your settlement system to report those out to you, and you'll have to marry them up in a in a fashion similar to uh, what PowerSim is putting out, so you can compare uh, line items. But when you have those, you'll be able to find drivers and understand, for example, how hedges performed and how could they be improved, or what variations of performance are hedges not covering, and what are we exposed to, and can we do anything about them? Um, in this data here is going to set this up to explain. Um, uh, we're going to have, for example, here, ask the asset at the time of the budget, the expectation was about 700,000 megawatt hours of production. Uh, by the time I, I started the month, I was projecting a million megawatt hours, and then I realized 900. That's kind of how I should realize, uh, read this. Um, so I've got a 300,000 plus variance from budget to forecast and a negative 100,000 variance from forecast to actual. Or said differently, I've got a... Uh, a plus 200,000 variance uh, from actual back to budget. So what does this tell us, right? So um, item A here, our assets, megawatt hours. Um, market prices increased, budget to forecast, but they fall from forecast to actual. Maybe I have some forced outage rate um, that I didn't expect that was higher than, than, uh, than I would have otherwise modeled. There could be different drivers for coming in lower on volume. Uh, this B point here, this dispatch price, so this wholesale price is the block price that we're assuming from our forward marks uh, for our time of our budget and the beginning of month. So, uh, you know, if I'm sitting on December 31st and I'm going uh, half the year into the, to the year, my market price has moved daily. And by the time the contract's about to expire, it's risen from 45 to 52. When settlement is done and all the hourly prices come in and I average them hourly for the month, after the fact, I might say that they were actually 49 in this example. So prices came in, uh, were expected to be much higher than budget, and they came in uh, still higher than budget, just not as, as extreme an increase. This C point is really important to explaining things, especially when you're trying to separate your asset and your hedges and understand the movements. So the basic concept here um, is that your asset price is an LMP or a node different um, than the wholesale hub. So you might have uh, PJM West, for example, as your hub, and maybe your node is at your generator, and the price at your generator is different. So you have a basis risk. In this case here, um, the traded price was $49, but my generator only got paid um, at an LMP on average for the hourly average for the month of $46.55. Now, the asset actually then captures a different rate than that even that basis point uh, from the hub. My asset um, might be running in a certain way, and uh, I might maybe I have an outage when prices were the highest, so I don't realize the price at the level um, that I was otherwise going to uh, see it happen on average. So in here in this case, a $49 hub price uh, was a 46.55 unit LMP on average, but was the unit only captured 41.90 on average when you multiply out uh, the megawatt hours you produced against the time and the price in those time periods. Typically, what you might see for an asset, all of SQL, is that the price of the LMP is uh, slightly lower than what the asset captures. So the asset is an option. Uh, it's going to respond to hourly prices, and you typically would expect to see it slightly higher. But circumstances or conditions can be such that you anticipate um, uh, causes for differently. And in this case here, we might assume or find that third week of the month was the highest priced in the unit experienced an outage that third week. And so I didn't participate in that. I didn't capture that. Um, in each of these, to keep it simple and clean, we've assumed the cost of the asset is $25 a megawatt hour. And then I can see the spread I'm capturing. Uh, the hedge rate would be the, the, the price of the hedge uh, at the time that I put it on. So here in this case, um, I have 
a $45 hedge for 585000 By the time the beginning of month starts, I've added to my hedge level. And uh, I've done it at a price slightly higher than the $45. So on a weighted average basis, I'm at 47.18. So my aggregate hedges, my 850,000 in hedges, have a, a sale price of 47.18, if you will. The margin for my asset in each of these instances, 11 with zero payoff because those hedges were at the money, 23 with a hedges paying off as negative four to realize 19, and 15.2 uh, with the hedges paying off uh, 1.5 million and uh, realizing 13.7. So the question that comes up with this last line, D, is um, where did the value go? Why did it go away? So I might enter uh, the month telling my CFO, hey, we're projecting to make 19 and we had only budgeted 11. It's going to be a really great month. And then I only show up with 13. And he may be excited that he's going to get you know, two and a half million more dollars uh, relative to budget, but he's already told the C, C, uh, CEO and the street or somebody who cares that it was going to be a big month and it didn't come anywhere close to that. I'm six million behind the beginning of month forecast. Why did it vanish? And that's where having the data uh, in a lot of detail, but being able to bring it together in a pretty concise and clear fashion helps people understand what's going on. So what are those drivers? What is the risk in this portfolio that produced results moving so much from one period to the next, uh, from forecast to actual? Um, remember, we're talking about value here, not volume. So it's not merely a notion of the volume. Uh, it's with energy, when is it created? Not, not just how much did I create uh, at a set price. Uh, that said, it can be more than volume and price. I need to understand and track and address the nuance of what's happening in my portfolio, things like basis um, and shape or that capture rate. Also things that I didn't work into this example but would be relevant, um, the heat rate performance, the efficiency of my asset can have an impact on the payoffs. My day ahead in real time, if, if the market has a day ahead in real time uh, uh, process, what is the difference if my assets are clearing day ahead? Uh, if they're showing up in the real time, what what is the vol? Where's the volatility? Is it in, in the real time? So forth. Um, and then fuel. The fuel can have an impact. What type of fuel was actually used? What's the basis um, on the fuel uh, relative to where you might otherwise be able to buy or sell it? Say if it's natural gas and you contract. Uh, through Henry Hub, but you actually have to have it delivered. What are the price points and how do those things move around? So looking back to this slide, if we take the difference between budget and forecast and then the difference between forecast and actual, we show these two columns. Um, so I was up 300,000 on my volume, uh, then stepping through the month, I came in 100,000 below that expectation or that change. You can see these price differentials. So then when I spell things out, where is the variance? My forecast went from 11 point, or my, I'm sorry, my budget went from 11.3 to my forecast of 19.3. That's this 8.1 million. Uh, additionally, my forecast to my actual dropped from 19.3 to 13.7. That's this 5.7 million. So how do I explain to the relevant parties why I was up 8 million relative to budget, but then I was down 6 million relative to forecast by the time the month realized. Um, this is cut off here, I apologize, but volume variance. So I'm gonna value how much my volume change cost me. So being up, I made 5 million more with this extra volume. Being down, I lost three. Um, the market price variance uh, at, at the forecasted volume uh, I was six million better because prices were so much higher, right? My my spread was up seven dollars, and subsequently it dropped six fifty. So my uh, volume variance uh, was three, and my my price variance was three. So I was six million behind on volume and price, and that's seen right here. However, I had hedges. So if I was hedged, and my hedges paid off positive to opposing this negative six million. 
and it, to the tune of 2.6, I should be about $3 million uh, behind, not 5.7. So where did this other 3 million or 2.7 million in value loss happen? Well, when I come through and I look, I can then explain that um, there's some change in my price and change in my volume produces a, a number here, 300,000. Uh, then additionally, I've got basis, and my basis change between my pricing points actually was better than I forecasted. It was to my favor, so I made 400000 there. The biggest impact was the capture rate premium relative to those volumes. So again, in this example, what we would likely find is that the asset was offline when the prices were the highest. Um, that happens a little bit in this, but it's kind of lost in the, the budget to forecast simply because of the positive impacts that are happening related to um, price and, and production levels. So understanding those risk drivers gives you this sort of picture. You can see the, the actual uh, for budget forecast and actual. You can see your variance drivers. You can explain things. Um, and PowerSim can provide this detailed simulation data. You need to be able to dig into these things, be able to set them up. You're going to have to get the actuals. You're going to have to bring it in and understand it. But you can clearly see um, that there's value in this from the standpoint of doing your job better as a portfolio manager, as a commercial team, as well as um, explaining things to your internal clients as to, to what's transpiring, what's happening. The, the key thing here, too, to remember is that this $2.6 million really only offsets this market price variance of $2.7 million. Um, that hedge was in place. My volume changed. I had capture change. I had basis change. Other things moved, and my final answer came out as such. Um, active active hedging through the year is important. Uh, going through the month, even we have found, is very important to adjust our positions when we find out about outages, when we uh, find out about uh, changes in our loads and our forecasts for the weather and such. So active hedging throughout that year is, in, is important for enhancing value. So even when you set an optimal hedge level at the beginning of the year, you don't want to set, take a set it and forget it approach because it leaves money on the table. Uh, if you have a real option, a physical asset, that gives you an opportunity to add value and actively managing your position around those assets can give you the ability to optimize a lot of that value. It's difficult to, to, to optimize um, what you can in a model, per se, in reality, because there might be some transactional constraints uh, that, that become an issue. But you can at least see what it is and know how much of it you're, you're going after and how much you're getting. If communicated well, finance departments will want that enhanced value in next year's budget. So you've got to make sure that there's a clear understanding of what um, what value can be created through different aspects of your risk policy and the permissions and, and uh, allowances you're afforded uh, as a team to go out and get that value. Uh, if the risk policy doesn't let you move your hedge level around very much, then capturing optionality is going to be limited. But if you can demonstrate the value proposition, get the permissions, set up your shop so that you're hedging, uh, you're hedging your assets, you're not speculating, but you are actively managing that asset in the market, you're going to be able to um, capture value. So as we close, just some final, uh, final summary back to, to the introduction. Um, we want to move away from pure position metrics. We want to move toward value metrics uh, that, that inform our risk so that we're hedging based upon um, our uncertainty as opposed to just picking a number and then reporting a, a risk metric uh, or risk value, dollar value, based upon some arbitrary hedge level. Uh, we should research and understand different risk metrics, know which one is most informative to our business and our firm. We should be sure that we're hedging at the time of our budget, so we're preserving the value that we um, commit to delivering. And we should monitor that, track the actuals, be able to report back the sorts of things that um, happen during a time period, the changes that are happening with the portfolio so people can understand and appreciate and explain to others why results are different than maybe the expectations that were established in a, in a budget or forecast. 
the value also that comes from it is not merely, again, not merely telling people what happened and why, but understanding and learning ourselves so that the risk drivers um, that caused events to happen can be managed better in the future so that we can learn from our mistakes or learn from the opportunities that we seized, maybe inadvertently, uh, so we can look to pursue them later or protect ourselves later. Um, another aspect of that is that the concept of the block hedge and, and whether you're using that, whether you're using tolls or other instruments uh, to hedge will have an impact on uh, how good your, your hedge fits your, your asset. And then lastly, consider that active management of the portfolio. Um, that's a, a valuable tool to adding uh, value to the business, and, albeit while you're managing your, your risk. That's the end. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, my email address is scott, S-O-T-T dot Rigglesworth, W-R-I-G-G-L-E-S-W-O-R-T-H at A-E-S dot com. Thanks.